11 or 12 years old, I was playing in youth orchestra. And as the youngest trumpet player in the youth orchestra, you know, there'll be six of us sitting in a line, um, I was allowed to play in the really loud bits. So I spent my whole time in youth orchestra rehearsals counting. Count the bars rest, wait for half an hour, and then just before I should play, the conductor would stop me. So I had to find a way to, to you know, make the evenings as interesting as possible. Obviously, it's not allowed to read a, a book or something while you're waiting. Um, but I discovered that you could read the score. So I'd go to the library and borrow the, the scores. For me, that made these hours of, of doing nothing suddenly extremely interesting. I got a kind of curiosity about what the conductor was doing and why they would stop in certain places, why they would ask certain things, what difference would that make. The conductor's the one person in the room who, who's always <laughs> involved in what's going on and, and that attracted me. When I met Simon at 16, I, I'd maybe done two or three pieces as a conductor. And that strength of personality, um, if you meet them at any point in your life, they're going to have a huge influence on you. But if you're 16 years old and just discovering something new, the, his influence on me was enormous. He's someone who has an amazing ability to analyze what's going on. So he could look at me conducting and have really practical and perceptive things to say about what I was doing. He was a huge influence on me as a personality, but also a really strong, concrete, practical help. Abado I met later, um, but I was still very young. I was 19 when I went to work with him. And his whole approach is very different. He would never say anything particularly focused or direct about my conducting nor was he really like that in rehearsal. And I learned from him much more from just being around and watching what he was doing and over time kind of being influenced by it. And they are both you know, two of the most fascinating and extraordinary musicians that I've met and so completely different. And I think that to have spent time with either of them would be an amazing gift. But to have spent time with both of them and Two people so very different is, a, is an extraordinary gift. When I started traveling and conducting kind of full time, I was, what, 20 or something. And the first years of that, almost every week, you're going to a new city, standing in front of a new orchestra and conducting a new piece. And I think those are the hardest years that there are as a conductor. Um, when I was 17, I studied in Tanglewood, a man called Robert Spano, who's been for many years, who was for many years, the music director in Atlanta. And he told me something very important. That when, he, um, when he first kind of went out to start um, a career on his own, Ozawa said to him, be ready, the first years are very lonely. And he said it's one of the best pieces of advice or one of the most important things anyone ever said to him. And it was very important for me that he told me that too. In the end, the simplest advice is always the best one. And that's, um, again, it's a Simon Rattle thing. It's basically, you don't do anything until the break except let them play. <laughs> you know, conduct, conduct, let them play, come back after the break and you'll know immediately whether they're, they're on board or not. And then you can start doing your, then you can start doing your work. There is an evolution. For sure, I take more pleasure now um, in having all my ideas and all the things that I imagined before I came um, challenged and changed by what I discover when I come to rehearsal. Um, that the ideas and the personality of the orchestra, um, the effect that that has on what I imagined we would do, gives me more pleasure now than when I was younger and, and I felt a real need to try and, and fight to create that which was in my head before I came. I don't know what's right. I think that the joy of making music is this meeting um, between, between people, between ideas, between perspectives. It takes a certain confidence to say, I can allow a lot of the things that I imagine to change because the people I'm working with um, bring so much to the table. And at the same time, I know that I can still uh, form that into something that's coherent and something I believe in. So I don't think that's something that you can 
um, expect a, a young person to be extremely comfortable with. And I think after 30 years, I, I start to <laughs> find my way with that. But it can change a lot, yeah. I flew a little bit when I was a teenager. And then, you know, with all the wonderful things that happened for me with music, I didn't touch an airplane for a very, very long time. And then coming up to my 40th birthday, I had a very strong desire, two things. I wanted to take a little bit of a step back from music for a short period to, to reflect on all the experiences I've had. I think that in those years from kind of 16, 17 until my late 30s, I did so much and collected so many experiences. And at some point you need to stop and say, okay, can I also think about, about what I've learned and take some perspective on it? And the other thing was I wanted to give myself the greatest gift, which is to learn something new and just have a different, uh, a different challenge, just, just for the kind of for cleaning the brain. So I thought a long time about what I might do. And in the end, I said, oh, I'm, I, I'm going to go back and learn to fly because I, I never did it properly and I would love to do that just for the pleasure. And what attracted me to it is you have to learn a little bit about a lot of different things. It activates the bit of your brain that works with mathematics. You need to rethink everything or you know, find again everything you learned in school about physics. You need to learn about uh, the weather. You know, um, I thought it, it'll be good for me. And the experience of being in the plane was fantastic, but, but the experience of being a student was so fantastic. So I didn't stop. Um, I got my private license and I said, okay, what's next? And I just went step by step until I ended up um, qualified flying the Airbus A320. And then the guys with whom I qualified went off um, to fly their passengers around. And I went back to conduct Mala 8 in the Edinburgh Festival. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could do both? So I applied for a job and I got a job and <laughs> here I am doing both. And honestly, it means that for me now, I spend you know, 26 weeks a year in an airplane and 26 weeks a year conducting concerts. And I think it's the most healthy, sensational balance. Being an airline pilot today is so much about making good decisions and so much about um, dealing with the information that's, that's coming at you. And so is being a conductor. And a lot of the skills that are required for the two jobs are very similar. Um, the goal is very different. The thing of standing in front of an orchestra, you have 100 people playing, you're receiving that incredible amount of information. You've got to be constantly in front of what's about to happen. Um, you have a, a technique that allows you to deal with that whilst you keep complete awareness. And with all these things going on, you're keeping a sense of, of a priority and, uh, and a sense of perspective. That's very much like flying the airplane. Um, and in both jobs, we have to be very aware of and understand the question of risk for two very different reasons. And in music, the, the wonderful thing I've learned from flying is how fantastic it is to take risk in music making because that's where we find the real beauty and nothing terrible is going to happen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.